Good morning. Today is Christ the King Sunday, and so we have this little break that not every year has between Thanksgiving and the start of Advent, so we're going to take advantage of it. Bev, do you have a microphone? Would you like to say good morning to all those watching in YouTube land? Good morning, everyone. We all hope that you had a wonderful Thanksgiving and you didn't eat too much and uh, you enjoyed your time with family and friends. And uh, stay well, stay warm, love you and God bless you all. As we prepare for worship and Shelley brings in the light of Christ, would you join me in an attitude of prayer? Gracious God, creator of all that is and giver of life, we have gathered today in your house to give you thanks once again for the many blessings that we have. We have learned that to be blessed means to fulfill the plan that you have for us. As we wish other people a blessed day, may they fulfill the purpose you have in their lives And as we bless you this morning in our time together, may we recall that all the power to do these things comes from you and you alone. Help us to open our ears and our minds to your word and the music and the prayers that we share this morning as we celebrate Christ's kingdom coming on earth, not just far down the road in the future, But today, as we leave this place, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able and join me in our call to worship. Though the dark clouds cover us and the violent storms assail, When we feel lost and alone, wondering who will save us, thank God who loves us so much. Praise God who searches for us and brings us home. Amen. This bulletin cover is for all of you hunters who have forgotten what deer look like. I I will just say, if my brother Larry happens to watch, this is what they look like, because he hasn't seen any yet this year. And in our family, he is known as the Great Hunter. He's not living up to his name. Good morning. (laughs) It's good to be back. We're reading this morning from Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right, and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, Whatever you did for one of the, the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, 
Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to internal, eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. Be God. Join me in the unison prayer. Amazing God, you have allowed us the privilege all during this year to walk the pathways of hope with Jesus. Bring the joy of this day into our hearts. Flood our lives with your words of hope that our ministry may glow with the delight at serving you by serving others. Bless this church as we grow and continue to learn what you would have us do. Cause us to be a haven of peace and hope in this world that is bound in such anger and fear. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The epistle reading this morning is from the book of uh, Theseus, uh, verses uh, 15. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord, Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. And, 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 uh, and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church which is his body, the fulfillness of him who fills everything in every way. This is the word of the Lord. Well, we've got some of our wannabe children up here anyway. <laughs> Child at heart, right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes. And you would gladly go back at any moment, right? Yes. We'll put this out for anybody. What is the magic word you say when you want something? Please. Please. What's the magic word you say after you get something? Thank you. Oh, <laughs> there you go. Very good. Very good. We, we all pass that test. Ready for the next one? Oh, no. <laughs> this past week, of course, we had Thanksgiving. And it's a day where we could stop and think about all of the blessings we have. And we learn that when we bless someone else, what we're really asking is that the God will give them the power to be all that he planned them to be. Hmm. How many of us think we are all that God planned us to be? 
we don't have any perfect people here? Hmm. Imagine that. Henry, Henry's not here. I know he would have raised his hand if he was. But Cindy would set him straight, no doubt. I want to think about Thanksgiving as more than just one day. What do we do for people that have done something nice for us? Give them something nice back. Give them something nice back. We thank them. We thank them. Invite them to dinner. I like the way you think. <laughs> uh, right. Huh? Do something in return? Sure. Those are all ways we can live out our thanks. And that's why we title this Thanks Living. It's not just a one day event, it's the way we live our life. Are we grateful? I personally don't like driving in the city. So visiting my brother and sister-in-law just outside Rochester, it's city as far as I'm concerned, although they will disagree with me. But on the trip over to my nieces, takes about 20 minutes, you're surrounded by several hundred cars probably. And you get there, and which one do you remember? The one that went by at 90 miles an hour and cut everybody off zigzagging through. What about the others? We focus on the negative so often. It becomes a choice if we will see the good because our society somehow has gotten to the place where we see the bad. We know the news tells us there's horrible things that happen, but there's also good things that happen. For every car that cuts somebody off or won't let someone merge, there's also people who see a signal and give you space or let you merge into the traffic. It does happen, but we don't think about it because that's the way it should be. Well, in our minds at least. But it seems like it seldom happens because we focus on the negative. And that's just one example. We have lots of things where we look for the bad. But if we look for the good, we will find it because it's still there. People do nice things in return for you doing something for them. There are people who are truly appreciative of what you have given them. But we have to look because there are just enough negatives out there that we forget about the goods. Let's pray. Dear God, we come into your presence with thanksgiving. Help us turn our thanksgiving into thanks living. Help us notice the people around us who are in need and ways that we can care for them like you care for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Today is the last Sunday in the Christian year. Next week, as we begin Advent and things turn purple and the Christmas decorations all appear this afternoon, so they'll be ready for next week, we begin Year B. Such an exciting title, isn't it? You would think with all of the Christian terms, we could do something better than Year A, Year B, Year C for the lectionary, but Year B it is. Today is Christ the King Sunday, when we think about the fact that Jesus is more than just the baby we're celebrating during Advent and Christmas, that Christ has more than just those 30-some years here on this planet, that Christ existed before the creation story began, that Christ will exist for all of eternity and he took a brief moment out to become one of us so that we could relate to him. We often use the word Emmanuel, God with us. God put on flesh and walked with us and then sent his spirit to be with us always if we will believe. We welcome a baby in the next few weeks. We prepare the way once again for Christmas. But we remember, although he came to earth as a baby, 
he wasn't always that baby. And sometime in the future, unknown to us, he will also be our judge. The reminder today is it's not just our words that will be judged. We can read through one of the creeds, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus Christ, his Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit. What we will be judged on, however, is how we lived that out. Much like as I was talking to our children up here this morning, it's how we live that is important. Mr. Snyder, good morning. Our walk talks and our talk talks, but our walk talks louder than our talk talks. Soon to appear in a narthex near you on the wall in the back. The question, what must I do to be saved? Do you remember who asked that in the Bible? There were at least two. What must I do to be saved? One was the rich young ruler who remains unnamed. That's all we know him by. And Christ told him, you have done all of the right things. Now go and sell everything you have and give the money to the poor. And he went away sad because he couldn't part with his stuff. The other one pops up in Acts when Paul and Silas are in jail and there's this earthquake. All of the doors fling open and the jailer's about to commit suicide because he knows if he lost those prisoners on his watch, the Romans will kill him. And Paul hollers out, don't do it, we're all here. He came in and says, what must I do to be saved? Now that's a very important question. It's the A and B of our ABCs. We admit we're not perfect. We believe that Jesus is God's son who died for us and rose again as the final perfect sacrifice. But Jesus warns us in this passage from Matthew that that's not all of the story. I hear Paul Harvey coming back after the commercial break. And now you know the rest of the story, right? It's a very important question, but another question that may be equally important is what happens when Jesus returns? It takes us to the time where, yes, Jesus will be our advocate, but he's also the judge. And as I said, it's not our words, but our deeds that will be judged. I've said before, I don't fear so much the things I have done wrong when I stand there, because I know what those were. I was there. What I fear is the opportunities that I missed. What could have been if I had been listening more closely? if I had seen the person in need, if I had responded as Christ would respond. Those are going to hurt. Many of you know I have people approach me. I need help with rent. I need help with the car repairs. I need this. I need some gas to get my child to Rochester to the specialist, whatever the need may be. Some of them become routine, in one instance, I have actually said to the person, you know, I usually find your reasons very interesting, but if you expect me to help you, you're going to have to come up with a better reason than that. Sometimes I'm not very diplomatic, especially after routine visits for a while. There are other people that I would say I have probably helped much more than I should, because I see a glimmer of hope there. I see them trying. Now, others may disagree with me and say, I've helped too much. I have crossed that line into enabling. And that's always a fear because I don't want people 
to be lazy and not do what they need to do. But I also have to realize that my point of view and my priorities are not always theirs. I remember when I was down at Centenary and Pastor David Wolcott was in the next office and you see the person come in with the new pack of cigarettes rolled up in the shirt sleeve and say, I don't have money for milk or bread for my child. Oh, really? You had 10, minute, 10 bucks a few minutes ago. You know, you made a choice. But I also realize how powerful some of those addictions can be. We all have addictions to one thing or another, probably, or a tendency toward them. Mine happens to be refined sugar. <laughs> Speaking of which, if you're staying afterwards to help decorate, I brought some of my sister-in-law Judy's favorite caramel corn. I'll tell you, it's the best I've ever had. So if you weren't planning on staying, you might want to stick around at least for a little while. Pretend to do something, and then you can have some snacks. We, I was teasing her this week about she should go into business, and she says, you know, several people have said that. And the answer really gets down to if she valued her time and how complicated it is to get everything to just the right temperature and have the popcorn just right temperature and all of those things, you couldn't afford it. She'd have to sell it in a specialty catalog where they get 50 bucks for an ounce of popcorn or something. It's amazing, but it's very good. And I will tell you, although I have the recipe, I've never made it myself. <laughs> because I value my time more than I value that popcorn. <laughs> there is a little bit of reality in the Ma Gospel of Matthew, as we heard earlier. This is one of Jesus' last public teachings, as it's recorded in Matthew, and it's not a parable. He gives more of a revelation of the future. It's going to be looked at how we lived out the compassion and kindness and love for others. How do you think you're doing? Now, I want to back up just a second as I say that, because it sounds like if you're a good enough person, you can get into heaven. And that's not how it works. A lot of people in our culture, if you ask, are you going to heaven, they will say, I think so, because I'm generally a good person. No. You're going to heaven because you believe Jesus Christ is your Savior, period. It's not really complicated. Living it out sometimes can be complicated, when Jesus said, love God and love your neighbor, we do it, commit our lives to serving God by serving one another. Sometimes that's hard. Sometimes it's beyond hard. It feels downright impossible. If you met some of those people, you'd know. And you think, God, do you really mean this person? <coughs> Someone else can love them. I'm moving on. Right? Those of you who work with people on a routine basis understand that. There are some people who are just not very lovable. <laughs> yes, as the saying goes, the more people I meet, the more I love my dogs. Yes, I do. Hmm? They don't talk back. They never ask to borrow the car. I don't have to save for their college education. And if all else fails, euthanasia is still legal. <laughs> I remind that occasionally for them. No, not really. As we move closer to losing my older dog and she struggles a little bit more with keeping the hind end going with the front end, uh, it's one of those, the, 
the spirit is willing, but the body is weak type of thing. Yeah, you know, I say that basically tongue in cheek, but there is a grain of truth in it too. <laughs> oh. One of the things that I hear often in our culture today, it is not our place to judge. Have you ever heard anyone say that? Yeah. I think Jesus would disagree. And Jesus didn't do it in anger, but he never told anyone that he had healed or that was brought to him, go and continue sinning, did he? Yeah. He said, go and sin no more. He called a sin a sin, and that's defined by God's book, not by each one of us. We may not like all the rules, but that doesn't change the Bible. It's like people today who don't like something that happened in history. Well, guess what? You can't change history. That's why it's history. It's done. It's not there for you to like or not like. It just is. Hopefully, we learn something from it. But when we see people today, often we don't know our history. And the same happens in the church when I hear people say, well, we don't need the Old Testament. Yes, you do, because the Old Testament tells you why we need a Savior. It is the lead up, the preparation for why did Jesus come to earth? Because we as people can't keep ourselves close to God. There aren't enough bulls and goats and sheep to sacrifice to cover everything that we do. So Jesus came as the final perfect blood sacrifice that was required to cover our sins. Second Timothy says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. There is an element of judgmentalism in there, isn't there? I'm telling you what you're doing is wrong. And I believe it's wrong because God's word says it's wrong. Now that's not a comfortable confrontation for many of us. But if it comes down to it, and you are sure that that is what God's word teaches, you are free to judge. However, I'll put this in a little parentheses, italics, bold, underlined, highlighted. You better look at yourself first. If you're going to try and correct other people, their first reaction is to tell you what's wrong with you. Jesus said when the woman was brought to him who was caught in adultery, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. How many people cast their stones? Nobody. Not even Jesus who was the only one qualified under that. Interesting thought for us. I know I have shared this story before, but it was one that came to my mind, and some of you will not have heard it. There was a, a farmer once who really struggled with the Bible. His wife was very devout. She was raising her kids in the church, but he just couldn't grasp things like the virgin birth, the resurrection, those things that just seemed impossible because we don't ever see them. He wanted to be able to see everything that the Bible talked about, and otherwise he was having trouble with that. He wasn't really 100% convinced that God even existed. And one night when they had, his wife and the kids had gone to a, a Christmas concert, there was a flock of geese that landed at his farm. They had gone as far as they could. They were exhausted. The winds had picked up. The snow was falling at a tremendous pace. Landed in his pasture. They were from me to our side door away from a warm barn. He thought, if I could just open that, I could at least save some of them. 
So he went out and opened the door, and what did the geese do? They ran away. They weren't used to a person being out there. He tried to move around back and herd them in. That didn't work either. He tried backing away and hoping that they would get the idea that there's safety here. It's available for you. And they didn't want any part of it. He tried laying out some breadcrumbs, and they'd follow for a little ways until they got too close, and then they'd fly back to the rest of the flock. Finally, in really in frustration, after he had watched them and tried over and over, he said, why won't they follow me? Don't they understand I'm trying to help them? Can't they see that this is the only place they can survive the storm? How can I possibly get them into safety? And he thought for a moment and says, the only way would be if I became like the geese. If only I could become one of them, then I could save them. They would follow me and I would lead them to safety. And as he was thinking those thoughts, he heard the words again, if only I could become like one of them, then I could save them. And a Bible verse came to his mind, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He knelt down in that barnyard and he finally got it. Jesus wanted to be one of us so that we would follow him, so that we would know that our God is not just something way off there who doesn't understand what we go through, someone who's been tempted the way we are. Emmanuel, God with us. Now there is a a little bit of a shock to the system when we think about God fitting in human form. And we'll work on that through Advent and the Christmas season. But we know that there's no one here who's perfect, seeing as Henry isn't up here yet. (laughs) There's no one here who's perfect. We keep failing, we keep trying, we come back week after week to try and learn a little bit better and go out and try again. Our signs out front remind us to be a disciple and on the way out, you are entering God's mission field. How we live tomorrow may affect someone's eternity. We don't know who that is that God may put in our path, but it is, that person is there for a reason and you are there for a reason. So with that understanding that it is God's power that allows us to do that, I will say to each of you, have a blessed week. Be all that God calls you to be and be aware of the opportunities he puts in your path. Let us pray. Gracious God, help us to be a disciple, to recognize that our power comes from you And on our own, we can do nothing. And yet you love us so much. You even gave your only son. Help us to be his disciple, to bring his kingdom, his love, his acceptance, his mercy to our world here and now as we wait for his glorious return. Lord, help us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Gracious God, we know that all good things come from you. As you receive our tithes and offerings, bless them, multiply them, and use each of us to bring your kingdom right here, right now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, would you receive our benediction? You have been called by Jesus himself to go into this world and make disciples. We know that is only by the power of the Holy Spirit living within us. And because we understand that is what true blessing is all about, I wish you all a blessed week. In Jesus' name, amen.